Welcome to the third Michelson Postdoctor Prize Lecture. Uh, this is the long delayed 2020 Michelson Postdoctor Prize Lecture Series, which is a real highlight of our academic calendar. For those of you who were not the first two talks, I should remind you that the Michelson Postdoctor Prize is awarded annually by the Physics Department at Case Western to an early career physicist in any subfield. Uh, in part because of the remarkable previous winners of the award, it's become established as one of the premier awards uh, for physicists at the stage of their career. Uh, Thibaut Soyer is the 24th recipient of this award. Uh, he was the unanimous choice of our committee from a very impressive a pool of nominees from around the world. Thibaut did his PhD in Paris in 2015 and postdoctoral work in Lausanne and the University of Liege in Belgium. He's now a CNRS researcher in Montpellier. In the third lecture today, he's going to return to the subject of electron phonon interactions in two dimensional materials. And those of you who attended the first two lectures uh, know we have something to look forward to. But before uh, I can allow Tibu to tell us his story, I would like to call upon our chair, uh, Corbin Covart, to formally award the 24th Michelson Postdoctoral Prize uh, to Tibu Soye. So, congratulations, Tibu. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm uh, Corbin Kopal. I'm a uh, co-chair in the Department of Physics here at Case Western and the Soviet University. It is my delight and privilege uh, to, uh, to, 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 to give uh, this award uh, for the uh, for the Frank uh, Michelson Postdoctoral Prize. Um, the award, uh, just so that people uh, can award include the certificate. Uh, uh, let me read what the certificate says. Uh, it says, uh, Jibol Soyeh so has been awarded the 2020 Michelson Postdoctoral Prize for his contributions to the theory of two-dimensional materials, notably for studies of electron phonon interaction and electron here. I should say electron transport, sorry. Um, and uh, and uh, of course the uh, the prize includes a, a check, which is uh, if I were to come up here. Uh, but I am uh, again delighted uh, and happy to, to present the award to you. Uh, Thank you. Give you uh, my congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, all right, and now without further ado, we will give you the opportunity to tell us about electron phonon interactions. All right. Oh, you're right. Well, let me just, uh, well, thank you, uh, first of all. Um, Harsh and everyone I've seen this week, it's been a, a wonderful uh, time. All the, the chats and the lunches and dinners have had a really a great time. And uh, I mean, you treated me really well, and I'm very grateful. Um, so this is the um, third lecture. And um, so this is going to be about 2D electron photon physics from first principles. Um, and as usual, I'm going to start with the uh, acknowledgement. So here again, this is um, a work that I was done over uh, many years. So I really need to um, thank all my supervisors uh, along the along the years that we can see here, um, and also all the the postdocs and PhDs and master students that I talked to in those various labs um, along the years. So yeah, thanks to all of these people. Um, so this is the outline. It's pretty short. Um, we're going to talk about DFT and DF, well, density functional theory and density functional perturbation theory for gated 2D materials. Then um, we'll talk about polar optical phonons um, in two dimensions. And finally, some uh, effects of uh, some, some field effects, some effects of doping materials uh, on electron phonon interactions. And so, as you can see, it's rather short, but uh, we'll go into the, the details of things. We'll take the time to uh, go into the details. Okay, um, so first, let's look at how we do density functional theory of gated 2D materials. And the first step is to understand what we want to simulate uh, and really understand the specificities of it. And I think, maybe I can take that off, right? <laughs> Didn't realize it. Um, 
So I think Monday, I talked about all the wonderful tools that were developed around uh, 2D materials and the fact that um, really like experimental community uh, made great efforts to explore the flatlands. Well, it turns out the simulation tools also have to be developed and also have to be adapted to the, the, the flatlands. And this was a big part of, of what I've done in the, in the past years. And um, so this is what we're gonna talk about right now. So if we need, if we want to simulate those uh, systems, we must have tools that account for, uh, first of all, dimensionality, it's kind of obvious, um, and field effects. And as I said, Monday, uh, field effects are not part of the material uh, really, but in practice, they're so much common in all the um, experimental setups and all the devices, that it's just as if uh, it's part of it. We really need to include it in our simulation if we want to be anywhere near um, something realistic. So those are the two things we, we want to include. And um, we're gonna have to keep that in mind uh, when, when look at that, looking at density functional theory. And here is just a, um, a summary of how it works in, in practice. I'm not gonna go into the, the, the theory of it, but just like the really practical part of it. So the code essentially separates um, our material into uh, subsystems. So you have the ions, that would be the atoms minus um, whatever electrons are uh, participating to bonds or transport are just going around. And so those ions are uh, positively charged, and that's why we call them ions. Um, in our case, we also have the gates, so because we want to simulate gated to the material with those um, uh, gates on top or below the material to induce charge in the, the material. And finally, the, the main system here are uh, the electrons, and in particular, the electron density, because we have this theorem that tells us that the charge density at the, of the ground state is gonna give us all the physical properties of the system. And then we have this other theorem that tells us that we can look for this charge density by um, considering a system of non-interacting electrons moving in a certain potential. The certain potential has the name of the guys that made the theorem, and it's the cone potential that we see here. Um, and so we have, can we see this? Yes. Um, what the, the electrons feel are uh, the potentials from uh, the ions, so this subsystem, the gates, and then some potential generated by the electrons themselves. And in those two potentials, the Hartree and exchange correlation potential, you see that the, the charge density appears. So to know the, con the cone champ potential, you need to know um, the charge density. And how you know it? Well, you solve the system of non-interacting electron in a potential. So you write down the Schrodinger equation and then use those, um, the wave functions that you develop on plane waves. And finally, uh, this charge density is expressed as a function of this, uh, those wave functions. And as you can see here, you need the potential to get the density, but you need the density to get the potential. So there is a self-consistency here, and this is exactly how we solve this. We start with a good guess, or hopefully good guess, for the charge density, and then we um, compute the potential that corresponds to this, then compute the new density that would correspond to this potential, and so on and so forth, we iterate until we get uh, self-consistency. Okay, so this is the, the basic uh, skeleton of a DFT code, and it relies on potentials, as we've, we've discussed here, and the, the, the plane wave, so this uh, decomposition that we do here. Now, this implies a few obstacles if we want to do uh, 2D materials and gated 2D materials. The issue is that the use of plane waves implies 3D periodic boundary conditions, meaning you can't simulate your system, 2D system, completely isolated. You're gonna have some periodic images of it such that your entire system is 3D periodic. So this is kind of what I um, put here. So each uh, um, line here is a, is a system and you have several of them. Now, one could think, um, naively that maybe to get the properties of the isolated system, you just need to put enough vacuum in between the periodic images. And well, first of all, that's uh, very costly. Uh, when you add some uh, vacuum, you increase the cost of the calculation because um, your, 
you have more um, plane waves to consider effectively. Um, and moreover, it's not uh, completely uh, okay to do this. You will always have an issue, in particular with this, the kind of thing I study, which are uh, phonons. Because when you perturb a um, plane of uh, charges at a certain um, with a certain periodicity, with a certain wavelength lambda, then uh, this charge density will generate a uh, potential that decays in the out-of-plane direction on the same length, uh, wavelength or length scale lambda. And so when you are looking at um, phonons or perturbations in general at long wavelength, this extension in the out-of-plane direction is going to reach very far, and eventually it's always going to reach the periodic images. So Unless you put some infinite uh, vacuum between the periodic images, which of course in practice is not possible, you can't get rid of those uh, interactions completely. So the idea here uh, is to instead take the, the Coulomb kernel, which is the, the, what mediates all the Coulomb interactions, and truncate it. So cut it off at a certain distance, such that the periodic images don't see each other effectively. So without the cutoff, if I um, plot this potential and repeat it by each, on each um, periodic image, what I get, um, the effective potential felt by the electrons in total will be this, this red thing, which is the sum of all these things. And as we see, it's quite different from the initial potential generated by a single layer. But with the cutoff, effectively, you stop each potential uh, um, outside of a certain slab around each periodic image. So the periodic images are still there, but they don't see each other. They don't see the potentials of the, the next one. So that's the basic idea of um, the, the cutoff. Now, um, this is to deal with dimensionality. We also want to deal with the field effects. So we need to um, simulate the electrostatics of the FET setup, so the field effect transistor setup. The issue is that it breaks um, 3D periodic boundary condition. It doesn't, it's not compatible with it. And you can see it if you um, look at the electrostatic of such a system, so it's a very simple uh, kind of parallel plate uh, system. You have one uh, plane of uh, negatively, that is negatively charged and one that is positively charged. Um, one is your material and one is your gate. And like in a parallel plate capacitor, like it's electrostatics uh, 101, you have zero electric field outside uh, the capacitor and finite electric field inside. What this means in terms of potential is that you have constant potential outside and um, linear, either increasing or decreasing depending on polarity, um, inside between the two plates. And this implies that the value uh, here on the left of the potential and on the right is not the same because there's a potential shift. And of course this is not compatible with periodic boundary condition because there's, there would be a discontinuity here if you imagine a um, periodic box. Okay, there is still a way to charge a material in DFT and that's uh, the so-called gelium. So that's a uniform background of compensating charges. And um, it kind of works, but it, it's, it's quite different. Uh, if we zoom in on uh, the, the region around the, the material here, Oh yeah, and forgot to mention that this dip here is um, what you get when you do a DFT simulation, this kind of potential well in, in which the electrons go uh, around the material. Um, so anyway, if you zoom in on this thing, um, this is what you're supposed to get. So linear on one side and constant on the other. But if you look at the gelium, what it does, uh, it has this uh, symmetric and quadratic um, dispersion outside. So the electrostatics are very different. But fortunately, um, it turns out that once you have implemented the, this cutoff in the, the proper 2D uh, framework, the gates are relatively easy to implement. You don't have to worry about those periodic boundary conditions anymore. Everything kind of works out nicely. And this is what I try to show here. So first, let's look at this um, blue curve here. This is the potential generated by um, the charge material. So it is as you would expect. You have this, this, this dip that uh, was there before. And because it's charged, um, you have this linear um, potential on, on the sides. This is what you would expect from a charged plane in, in, in vacuum. And then you have those bumps here on the sides. So those are not real. Those are an artifact of uh, the cutoff that we are doing. And this is because 
to understand this, one has to understand that we don't cut off the potentials, we cut off the kernels. And the potential is a convolution of the density of charges and uh, the kernel. And so this cutoff actually moves, uh, slides around with, with the density. And so what happens here if you put a test charge, this test charge would feel only part of uh, the system that is uh, here. So it would feel some of the electrons of this material, but not all of them, and maybe not, uh, not the, the ions, for example. So there's an incomplete system, and so this is not a physical, the, um, anything that corresponds to uh, a real system. So, we define a physical region in between those bumps in which the potential is what it should be. And uh, this is here in, in blue here. Now you have the potential generated by uh, the gate. So oppositely charged, again, a linear thing, but uh, the opposite uh, slope all makes sense. Um, if you add the periodic boundary conditions, uh, then it's, uh, it becomes a so-tooth potential. And here again, it has a region, finite region in which it's uh, physical. Now, you can uh, take the overlap of those two, um, those two physical regions, and that's where the sum of the potential, so the total potential, will be physical. And this is what uh, you get here. You get exactly what you're supposed to get uh, for a field effect transistor kind of setup with, outside of physical region, some bumps and some weird things that are not physical, but we don't care about them because uh, the electrons are gonna stay within this region and they're not gonna explore those unphysical regions. And um, so here th there's no trick to um, apply the, the boundary conditions or anything. It's, it's done by construction. Each of this potential by itself, how it is um, constructed is already um, like periodic and it, uh, so the, the sum is periodic as well. There's nothing to um, like correct. Okay, um, so this was for the ground state because the potentials then gives you the um, energy if you just multiply it by the density, more or less. And from the ground state, then we can easily get the bands and um, the forces and uh, stresses as well. Um, then we're gonna talk about phonons and electron phonon interactions. This comes from the linear response of uh, density functional theory. So this is called density functional perturbation theory. And if you perturb with phonons, you get phonons and electron phonon interactions. If you perturb with an electric field, you can get the dielectric response as well. And here, the um, most difficult part, the main part of, of the work here was this first step, really, to compute the energy to have the right potentials and um, the right setup to compute the energy. All the rest is just derivatives of the, the same thing. And since the energy is all already 2D, uh, all the rest is relatively easy. It's easy because um, we're not applying some kind of post-process correction to the energy. The energy is computed correctly uh, to begin with, like from the start. Okay, so that was the um, implementation. This was done in Quantum Espresso. Um, the, um, the cutoff part, so the 2D framework part, is on the official version of Quantum Espresso. It is, there's a flag for it. You can look for it if you're a, a user. Um, and the um, field effect transistor part is not in the official version yet, but it's um, free to use on my GitLab. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some uh, applications of all this, some um, results that came out from this code. Um, and it's not gonna be just some simulations, there's gonna be also some models and analytical models that, were, um, that we were able to develop thanks to um, the, the, the code as well uh, as, a, as a support. So, and before that, we're, I mean, we're gonna talk about polar optical phonons, but before that, I'd like to talk about screen cooling interaction, which is a, a very important building block uh, about what we're gonna see. So the screen cooling interaction describes how charges interact in the material. And we're mostly interested uh, in it uh, in reciprocal space because we're gonna look at periodic perturbations with a certain momentum Q. That's, uh, that's what the, the Q here is. And here I write it in um, 3D and uh, 2D. And you, as you can see, it's quite different. Um, so the, the bare Coulomb kernel you might, you might know in reciprocal space is um, one over Q squared in uh, 3D, is the, the classic one. In 2D, it's uh, one over Q. 
And then you also have a difference in the dielectric functions here. In 3D, you can um, usually get by by just divided by a constant, the bulk dielectric um, constant of the, the material. But in 2D, it's quite different. It's uh, linear, so it has a constant term and a linear term. And this is because screening is inherently depending on um, the wavelength or the, the distances in, in 2D. So let's look at how it works. So first, at small momenta. So small momenta corresponds to long distances in, in uh, real space. And this will correspond to this term here being uh, zero or negligible, at least, in front of the other one. In this situation, so you have only this uh, constant term here. And what happens is that if you imagine two charges far away from each other in a, in a slab of, of 2D material, you can imagine that the, the electric field lines of representing the interaction between them is going to go through outside uh, the material. So this electric field is going to be screened by whatever is around the material, the environment. This is exactly what we see here. Uh, this contents here has this X um, uh, indication that says that um, the, the screening comes from the uh, exterior, I mean, the, the environment. Now, if you go at large momenta, uh, now this term uh, dominates here. And we're looking at short distances in real space. And you imagine uh, the same uh, charges, but much closer. And you can see that depending on the, the thickness of the material, if you get them close enough, the field lines are going to go stay within uh, the thickness of the material. And in this case, all the electric field is screened by the material itself. And in this case, this term dominates. And this RF here is really a material-specific uh, parameter. So this, is, this comes from the screening of the material. All right, so this is just the, the first order of dielectric function. In general, it's a bit more complicated, but this gives the, the, the main idea of, how, of what's happening there. OK, now we are um, ready to talk about the polar optical phonons and LOTO splitting in particular. Um, so I've already talked about those polar optical phonons, but just to um, give a quick summary, um, they are present in any um, material or semiconductor with um, more than one kind of atom. And that's because um, they, different atoms carry different effective charges. And when you move them with respect to each other according to a phonon displacement pattern, you're going to generate some little dipoles. And those dipoles are effectively represented by a polarization density that we see here. And then you can, from this polarization density, you get an electric field via this um, screen cooler interaction that we just talked about. And since this is different in 3D. In 2D, of course, the electric field is different in 3D and 2D. And then the energy of the dipole-dipole -dipole interactions that come and, uh, and um, modify the energy of the, the vibrations um, are different also in 3D and, and 2D. This is what we see here. So if you work out all those, um, those formulas, um, you can see that the, the contribution, this additional energy due to the dipole-dipole interactions is more or less constant uh, as a function of momentum in 3D. So essentially, it's the difference between this TO mode that we see here and the LO mode. It's a very well-known condensed matter um, mechanism that's called LOTO splitting. And the splitting is constant in 2D. However, the splitting is not constant anymore. It vanishes uh, at zero momentum, so at zone center here. And it starts with a finite slope here, which is very um, peculiar. Because if you look at a, um, a path in the Brillouin zone that goes through uh, the zone center, you end up with this discontinuity in the first derivative. So this uh, kind of like anomaly in the dispersion that's very, very specific. And, and you, you don't see those uh, very often in, in uh, in dispersions and phonons in general. And this um, discontinuity, you cannot get with periodic image uh, interaction. So you have to be in a truly 2D framework if you want to get uh, this, this thing. And here, um, the dashed lines represents what you get uh, without the cutoff. Even if you put a lot of uh, vacuum, you're always going to get uh, something a little different here uh, in the long wavelength limit in the asymptotic uh, limit. OK, so let's go a little bit deeper into what happens here. And um, 
So looking at the analytical formula, we can ask um, what happens when you add layers uh, on top, um, like several layers on top. And this is interesting because it gives you the transitions between um, 2D um, world, so 2D material, and the 3D counterpart, so the, the bulk part. So this is what we did here with boron nitride, and we had one layer, two layer, three layers, and see uh, how it goes. And if you look at the analytical formula and try to figure out where the number of layers com comes in, it comes in uh, here as a prefactor of, of this uh, um, parameter here. And this effectively uh, dictates the slope of the dispersion at, uh, at zero momentum here. So the, the slope increases with the number of layer. And um, then it also comes in the screening part here. And that means that um, the curve gets closer to the 3D, um, the, the bulk dispersion, faster and faster at smaller and smaller momentum. So it describes exactly what we see here, that the curve like, goes and goes to stick uh, to the, the, the dispersion that we see up there. And here, so uh, in phase LO just uh, means that we're looking at the mode that where the dipoles are in phase in different layers, such that the fields uh, add up. The out of phase LO is where the dipoles are out of phase, and the fields cancel each other. And this is why you have, um, in the end, no slope and zero slope uh, here. The other interesting thing to see is that we uh, already saw that like at long wavelengths, um, the uh, screening comes from the environment. And that's something pretty peculiar that we can try and um, look at. So here we take BN again and uh, put it on monolayer or bilayer graphene. So the, the thing to know here is that monolayer graphene screens like a bulk dielectric material for some reason. <laughs> because of the, the direct cones and all this, um, you end up with the same kind of screening as a bulk uh, 2D material. Uh, bulk, no, 3D material. Um, and so the effect is that the slope is divided by um, a, a constant, and this is what uh, we see here. If you use um, bilayer graphene, now it screens like a metal, and you get a zero slope as you, as you get to um, zero momentum here. And again, everything between the simulations and the analytical model like, fits uh, rather well. All right, so why is this uh, or important? I already mentioned it, um, but um, I mean, this came around uh, where uh, when we were doing this, this project of trying to find all uh, 2D materials that could be uh, exfoliated from known, experimentally known 3D materials. And um, so we made this database and computed the phonons, and about two thirds of the, those exfoliable materials are semiconductors, and all of those have LOTO splitting. So if you go on this database and click on a random material, there's a very good chance that you'll end up seeing those uh, characteristic sharp variation of the dispersion with some um, LOTO splitting. Okay, so um, that was um, polar uh, optical phonons. Um, now, the second application is just about uh, field effects. And again, well, I think I went a bit fast even, so we'll have time to go, um, to go slow in, in those uh, electrostatic doping effects. Ah, no, okay, sorry. <laughs> We're not quite done with uh, polar optical phonons. So, um, there is a counterpart of this uh, dispersion that is the coupling to electrons. So those dipoles create electric fields. You can look at how the electric fields couple to the, the atoms and the vibrations themselves. You can also look at how they couple to electrons because they're charged particles and they're gonna be sensitive to any electric fields going around. So again, same uh, electric field, it's different in 3D and 2D, so the coupling is different in 3D and 2D as well. And in 3D, as was well known uh, for, for some time, the coupling goes as one over the momentum, so it actually diverges um, uh, towards the zone center. This is what we see here. In uh, 2D, however, because this screen coulomb interaction has different uh, variation on the, the momentum, um, diverge, there's no divergence anymore. This linear term that we saw um, is important in the short wavelength limit, uh, goes away and you end up with the, the coupling, the bare coupling, divided just by the dielectric um, uh, function of the environment. And this is um, finite, it doesn't diverge anymore and this is what we see here. 
And this, can, um, this is actually pretty important um, for some macroscopic quantities because uh, many of them are related to an integral of the coupling over the Brillouin zone. And so, as you know, if you integrate a like one over x function with respect to a finite function, of course, you get very different um, uh, dependencies. Okay, and here again, we can uh, look at what happens when you change the environment to look at how this screening works. And uh, indeed, we see this very characteristic thing that in the long wavelength limit, screening comes from the environment. And so if you put uh, MOS2 either in vacuum or on SiO2, you get um, very different um, values of the coupling uh, at small momenta. All right, so this time we're done with uh, polar optical phonons. And we're going to um, talk about electrostatic doping effects. Um, and this story started um, with some uh, nice collaboration with a group of experimentalists in Geneva. So the group of Alberto Mopugo, who um, does some uh, Raman experiments on um, so transition metal dichacogenides. Those are what, 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 means, uh, what those TMD means. Um, so it's a family of materials. There are several of them um, that are, have similar band structure and phonon dispersion. The band structure looks something like this, and uh, the phonon dispersion looks something like this. And the material is, is, is here, um, represented here. So they have this very nice experiment where um, they um, gate or they dope uh, the TMD using um, ionic liquid gate. And this has the advantage of one uh, being able to dope the material a lot, uh, so put a lot of electrons or holes in uh, the system, and it's kind of transparent. So you can put a laser on top, shine uh, some, some, like send some photons in there, and see what happens in, 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 in matter, and, and do the usual Raman spectroscopy thing that's uh, actually a way to probe phonons. And in Raman spectroscopy, uh, essentially you get peaks, and those peaks uh, are situated at the frequency of vibration of, of the, the phonons. So it's a pretty direct way to study phonons. And here, in this case, you can study phonons as a function of doping in, in situ as you dope uh, the, the, the system. So very nice setup. Um, Another nice thing about this experiment is that they didn't do only for one TMD. Uh, they did it for three, so uh, WSC2 that we see here, WS2, and MOS2. And they get this very consistent result. So this is here the frequency of, um, two, oh yeah, I forgot to say, sorry, that we are gonna be interested in two final modes in particular. So this E2G, so this is the Raman nomenclature, but it's essentially this polar optical phonon that we've been talking about, is the longitudinal opti uh, optical one that couples to the electrons via the Frohlich interaction. And then we have this other one, this um, A1G, that's kind of a, um, uh, out of plane optical breathing mode that essentially changes the thickness of the material. And this was non-polar. There's no dipole created uh, with, with this one for symmetry uh, reasons. Okay, now uh, they look at uh, the position of the peak, uh, that is the frequency of the phonon as a function of doping. In particular, they look how it changes. They do this for uh, holes, so they dope uh, the, the uh, they put holes in the valence band and then they put electrons in the conduction band and, and they look um, at both um, changes in, in the frequency. So um, most of the time uh, it doesn't change, uh, so the, the frequency of the phonon uh, stays the same except for this A1G mode, so that's the, the change in the thickness. Um, for which the, the frequency goes down. So we call this softening, because essentially the, the frequency going down means uh, the phonon is less energetic, so it's kind of softer. And usually this kind of softening indicates a strong electron phonon coupling at small momenta. So you can see it as um, electrons and phonons conspiring to get the energy of the phonon a little less uh, costly, to make it a bit easier for the, for the phonon. The electrons are it's kind of, kind of helping out here. And, but it works only if there's a strong coupling between the two, otherwise um, there's nothing happening. So let's 
try to understand what, what's happening there. And let's uh, start with the easy case where nothing happens. So this is the, the Frolisch, um, the polar optical phonon, where the, the, the frequency doesn't change. There's no softening. No softening means no electron phonon coupling, which can be initially a bit surprising because we talked about this Frolisch interaction and we said that it's rather strong. Um, and I mean, we've seen that it, it has this like sharp increase uh, at small momenta. It, it looks rather strong. But the issue here is that you're putting carriers into your system. You're doping your semiconductor, and you don't have a semiconductor anymore. You have metal at some point. Once the Fermi level hits the, the, the bandage, you're, um, you have a metal. And uh, metals screen electric fields, which is the origin of, of all this coupling. So what happens here, and you, we can simulate all this. Um, we can plot the, the coupling to this uh, longitudinal optical uh, mode as a function of the momentum either in the neutral material, and we see here this increase uh, as we go to small momenta, or in the doped material, and in the doped uh, material you see this uh, decrease, even uh, this complete um, vanishing of uh, the, the coupling at zero momenta. And this is due to so free carrier screening, so screening from those added carriers. So weak electron phone coupling at small momenta, no softening, and um, the frequency is more or less constant. So this, we understand um, why this is the case. Now, why uh, is there softening on the other mode, and why is it only for electrons and not for holes? Like, what's happening there? We can do some DFT calculations. We are capable of doping the system with, with our gates, and we're capable of computing the phonons. So we can do this in those same three TMDs as the experiment. And this is what we get here in, in blue. In blue, this is the, the, the mode that we are interested in. And we get some softening, uh, but not quite the right um, doping dependency. So here for this material, it indeed softened for electrons and not for holes. This is what was we, we saw in the experiment. But sometimes it softened for both, and sometimes even for just holes and not electrons. So very confusing. We got very confused for several weeks uh, about this. The only good thing here is that this is DFT. So we can go in, 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 and look at different parameters and try to plot out things and really understand what's happening um, relatively easily, more easily than experiments at least. So we, try to, we, we manage to correlate the softening with double occupation of two valleys. So uh, here we need to go back at the band structure, look something like this, and uh, there are two valleys, so two uh, minima in the conduction band and two minima in the valley maxima in the valence band. And so um, there are two valleys. And we saw that um, when only one valley is occupied, you have no softening. And when two valleys are occupied, you have this softening. And so this is what is plotted here. This is a relative occupation of, of each valley. When uh, it's like 0 uh, and 1, there's no softening. When they're both occupied, you get some softening. OK, so um, double valley occupation gives strong coupling, gives softening. Here we, we are there. But why does double valley occupation gives uh, strong coupling? That's still uh, a mystery. And to understand this, we need to look at how um, the uh, electrons and phonons couple in this uh, material. And to do this, I'm going to go back to uh, this relatively intuitive pictures of um, the band structure moving as a function of the displacement pattern of the, the phonon. So this phonon, I said, is like a, a variation of the, the thickness of the material. This is what we see is depicted here. So the, yeah variation of the thickness. And here, we just compute those bands, the band structure of this material, uh, for each, each configuration that we see here. And we can kind of visualize the bands moving um, as a function of the, the phonon perturbation. And what's interesting here is that they move uh, out of phase, the different valleys. Um, so as we, you remember, we said there were two valleys, um, and, and this is what we, we need to look at. And as one goes down, the other goes up. And same on the other side. As one goes down, the other goes up. So um, yeah, out of phase deformation potential. Now, this is the first step in understanding what happens. The second step is understanding what this means in terms of screening. And we, we come back to screening a, a lot, but it is uh, quite, quite essential in electron-phonon interactions. So, 
the, the basic principle of screening is that you have a potential perturbation um, that will induce a uh, variation in the charge. This induced charge will then induce a potential, the induced potential. And then the screen potential is the sum of the perturbation and the induced potential. So in this story, um, you, you realize that you really need uh, some induced charge. If you have no charge induced, you have no screening. And this is what happens here. So let's look at first the, the single uh, valley case. We, we said that when only one valley uh, is occupied, we don't have this softening. So that's rather easy to understand. If we imagine uh, just one valley going up and down in energy, like, like in this plot here, we forget about the second valley. It's too high in energy. Uh, we, it, it doesn't matter for the electrons that don't see it. So we have only one valley going up and down. We need to keep the Fermi level constant. That's always the case. And you have the valley going up and down as a function of a space. You need to remember this is a phonon, so it, it it varies periodically as a function of space. It goes up and down, and in some, um, um, as it goes up and down, the, uh, the filling of the, the valley is gonna change. And this corresponds to a variation in the charge density. So there is here an induced charge density. It's gonna be periodic, and so there is an induced potential, and there is screening. So this kind of perturbation is screened. On the other hand, if you now consider uh, that two valleys are uh, occupied, and remember that they move out of phase, one is gonna go up, let's say, and that's gonna mean that it's gonna lose electron, and so have a negative um, density variation here, whereas the other is gonna go uh, down, and uh, gain electron, have a positive um, charge density variation. And overall, those two things, when it's positive, when it's negative, they cancel out. And they cancel out, it turns out, exactly um, for reason we see it in, in the simulations first, but then we thought about it and it kind of makes sense because um, in, in like very quickly, the amplitude of the perturbation and um, the electronic response are inversely proportional. They're both related to the density of states, the ratio of the density of states, but in, in um, opposite ways. So it makes sense that those um, induced entities actually uh, cancel exactly each other out. So no induced entity, no induced um, potential, no screening. So this perturbation becomes bare. Okay, now we can go back up the whole story. Um, when we have two valleys occupied, there's no induced charge, no screening. The coupling is not screened, it's, it stays bare, it stays strong, and so the phonons soften, and this is what we see in the experiment. Now just, just to say, like, why don't we find uh, the, the, the right result in uh, DFT with respect to experiment? This is important, it was the, the original point of, the, of the, 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 the exercise. Well, actually, the relative energy uh, of those different valleys here um, is no good in DFT, and we know it. Uh, DFT is just not capable of um, clear, um, accurately representing the, um, the, the, the position of those valleys in energy with respect to each other. And so the occupation, of course, of those valleys as a function of doping is wrong as well. Um, so DFT here, uh, it's not that it gave us the right result and fully um, re um, reproduced the experiment right away, but it gave us all the answers by analyzing what's, what's, what was happening, and now uh, we, we understand all the, the physics there. So this was a, a very nice project, in my opinion. And um, I think that's it for, yeah, I'm a bit advanced in the end, but good, we'll have more time for questions. So uh, we've talked about um, first principle methods um, that they need also to be uh, improved and modified to explore the flatlands. So we've seen um, like in details uh, a little bit this implementation of DFT and DFPT for gated 2D materials. We've looked at polar optical phonons in details and we've looked at this um, surprising increase of electron phonon coupling in multivalent materials. I'll just take one minute to say why it's surprising, because usually when you increase doping, you always um, assume electron phonon coupling to decrease because of this screening from the free carriers. So this increase as a function of doping when the two valleys get occupied is something that was um, never really uh, seen and, and, and understood and not expected. And that's it.
and he, now we have time for questions. So I guess the way we handle the Q&A, and I'm just gonna come near the mic so people on Zoom can hear me as well. Uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll just alternate between questions from the room and questions uh, on Zoom. Uh, for Zoom, raise your hand, and if I see you, I'll go ahead and unmute you. I call on you and unmute you, but we'll have to mute you again right after the question so that there isn't an awful feedback. So if I cut you off in the mid-sentence or something, please put it in the chat, and I'll uh, give you a chance to finish what you were saying. Um, all right, with that said, um, I guess it's open for questions uh, here or, or, or there. Um, all right, I guess I'm going to start with in the room then. Uh, and so I'll call on Jesse first. Um, so, uh, so, you, so at the end there, you're saying that, um, <laughs> so that means that experimentally based off it, in the conduction band of all three materials, those two minima are very close to each other. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, is that, I mean, is that, does that mean they're very close? Does that mean they're very close? So those exper those experiments are at room temperature, um, so we're talking close plus or minus uh, thirty millieV, so the yeah the room temperature energy because the yeah the the Fermi um, distribution is smeared by by the the temperature more or less. How far is it along in the, in the, DFT? the DFT it varies between uh, well about. A few dozens of millievs to 300. So, um, really, yeah, you have this order of magnitude. But here, from those experiments, oops, uh, one can maybe argue that this orange one is a bit further away. And it makes sense, actually, in DFT, we have the same ranking. Uh, but those two here uh, are probably very close within 0 to 50 millieV. Yeah. Um. All right, but I guess I'll call on Walter next. Um, yeah, so I have a few questions. Um, so my first question is, if very nice story about this effect of the golden effect on the hormones, but if you're on a level one effect there in the three dimension, it is the other bottom problem. Mm -hmm. So is that in the what plasmon coupling? Hello? Ah, yes. Um, so before you answer, is it possible to summarize the question? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. Um, the summary, Walter? So. Walter is, is asking whether um, this, this effect that we're discussing here um, can be related to um, the coupling between the phonon, the yellow phonon, and plasmons. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, it could. What, what could. I guess one could imagine that the, I mean, the, the nature of the plasmon changes when the two valleys are uh, occupied. With respect, with respect to one valley, you have now all of a sudden two Fermi surfaces, so two kind of doses to take into account, and, and, and things uh, change. Um, I don't have any good argument to say that it's not that, uh, other than we found this other thing that works really well. Um, but uh, uh, so I know like that the, the, the entire energetics of uh, all, both the plasmons and, and the phonons are uh, a bit different. And um, I think it, it might have to do with the, um, uh, also the, the group velocity of the, uh, of the phonon. And uh, that, that's a bit different here in uh, 2D with this, this finite uh, this slope of the dispersion. Um, so I think there, there are uh, some uh, differences. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it more. Yeah, it's a very nice question. I, I guess I had a question, which is sort of a larger big picture question. I have some detailed questions too, but I'll ask you those later. Um, the sort of big picture question is just that, um, you know, field effect devices have been studied for quite a long time. This is sort of prehistory to them. Now we're talking about graphene and all these exfoliated materials. But there's also gallium arsenide and silicon sea moss uh, and all of that. It's also field effect devices. Mm -hmm. um, is it the case that there's been, you know, has this all of this been studied before? Or was it the case that DFT was not very sophisticated back in the 1980s? And so, you know, these issues have not been studied in connection with silicon before? 
Um, no, you can find a, a lot of, uh, of like uh, links with. Uh, oh yes. Um, so Harsh is asking, um, like, how all this relate to the um, previous literature about like uh, 3D kind of field effect, 3D materials in the field effect transistor setup, which of course have been around for um, a long time. And um, so yes, there's a lot of links. I mean, I I, I keep going back to to this literature. And, and look at uh, this. And in, in this particular example, there was some, um, uh, I think, a uh, couple of gentlemen from Russia um, that asked themselves whether all deformation potential should be screened or not, and what happens with uh, multi valley uh, interactions and all this. They were considering here uh, mul multiple valleys, but within each other, not, uh, uh, not yet there, and not necessarily out of phase, which was the, the, the difference here. But um, yeah, those questions were, um, were kind of similar things were um, reached. I would say one specificity of the 2D materials is that you can induce all this charge in a very limited um, like layer. Mm -hmm. So here we're, we're talking, I don't know if there's the number uh, somewhere, no, but we're talking 10 to the 14 electrons per centimeter square, and that's in one, like, you know, uh, a couple, a uh, few angstroms of, of thickness. Um, then in 3D, it goes over a few layers, depending on the, the depth. Um, and um, like, so, so the, the kind of variation of the Fermi level within the band structure that you get is quite different. Uh, and this is in part why we're able to explore uh, different valleys, occupation of different valleys, and, and, and all this here. Yeah, but it seems like some of these issues must come up, like you know, the, the issues you were talking about the first part of your talk, the periodicity and so on. Yeah. I wonder if you can make a real killing in the CMOS field, which is quite important. <laughs> Uh, but all right, well, that's, uh, that's for, for the discussion. Are there more questions in the room? Or on, or on Zoom? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, uh, your comment of the uh, implication of your uh, findings related to the transformer coupling, you know, to the like, superconductivity in the AD2D materials. So, uh, superconductivity super was observed back in, in those TMDs. Yes, I think it's like a direct or like a... Yes. Also for recently, this is... Yeah, okay. Um, so I should repeat here. Sean is asking about uh, relation to superconductivity in TMDs. Uh, well, I'll do TMDs first. Um, so yes, I'm not in the superconductivity um, community, so I hesitate to make some big claims about it. But uh, Mopungo, which was the experimental guy um, in, in, this, uh, in this collaboration, is. And uh, so it, it, like, we did take this as a possible origin of the superconductivity you get in TMDs at uh, high doping. Like this superconductivity does happen more or less when you hit the, uh, the, the, the second valley. So it's, it's related. Is it exactly this effect of like, the, the screening going away? Um, I think there's, there's like a, a good chance, um, but maybe there's like, maybe we, one needs to go in the, like the full theory of superconductivity and describe the superconducting state with all those valleys a bit more um, to, to really uh, prove it. So um, yeah, I think it, it's possible. And concerning the bilayer graphene, um, so there's still some debate about the origin of the, um, the superconductivity in there. Um, there are a couple papers talking about electron front coupling being the origin of that. Um, I kind of like it. And uh, it comes from uh, the idea, I mean, the, the, the main intuitive idea is that um, when, you, when you do those moiré pattern, um, you can induce huge variation of the moiré pattern by just small acoustic uh, phonon perturbation. So by just moving a little bit, the, the moiré pattern uh, changes on, on huge land scales. And so, this kind of electron front coupling, I mean, you, you change the moiré induced potential um, quite a bit with small things, and so strong electron front coupling, possible superconductivity. I kind of like the story, but yeah, it's a big debate. Uh, 
Uh, okay, well, maybe I'll let Jesse ask the last question, and then we, we can just carry on with private discussions. Right, uh, sure, thanks. So, just, uh, I was wondering if you were saying that, you know, you, you have to calculate the doping uh, correctly, uh, to have the like exposure uh, potential, uh, and then it's more frequently would be calculated using that symmetric, you know, yep. uh, is it you can just qualitatively different Results, or are there things you could not have So, um, uh, yes and no. Actually, for what we've uh, seen today, uh, like if I'm completely honest, like those uh, TMD stuff, those effects are probably not too much affected by this. Um, however, in TMDs, you can look at um, sock effects and like all, all this thing, then here the symmetry is gonna play uh, an important role. And one other like obvious application in which this plays a, a big role is, uh, I've, I've mentioned it, the coupling of the acoustic out of plane phonon of graphene uh, with the gates. This is completely dependent on the, the kind of symmetry. And um, yeah, and in overall like this is, we're not quite sure uh, what, what does or doesn't and yeah develop the tools to do it as an experiment and we're exploring and hopefully we'll find uh, more that where it's important, yeah. Well, I think uh, in view of the time, uh, I suppose. Just one more thought, we have to end it. I'm a very happy note. Why is it not going to be a very happy <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, Fröhlich, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So that was the name of the. It's, it's a happy coupling, yes. So the Fröhlich coupling is, is, is a happy one, yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a great note to end up. Uh, and we look forward to, of course, the last talk in the series, which is tomorrow. I can't believe we're already at that point in the week. Yeah, went uh, fast. It's been a, yeah, looking forward to that. Tomorrow, 12.45, uh, 40 room or by Zoom. So see you there, and uh, thanks.